Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome our next guest for our discussion, the future of the art museum, Charles Salmara Smith, who is one of the world's most eminent art historians, curators, and museum directors. He has helmed some of the UK's top art institutions as director of the National Portrait Gallery, direct, director of the National Gallery, and chief executive of the Royal Academy of Arts. During his time at the National Portrait Gallery in RA, he oversaw the opening of the new Ondacha Wing and was responsible for a substantial enlargement of the Royal Academy that included the restoration of the Keeper's House and the development of Burlington Gardens. He is also the author of several books, including East London, Your Place in the Sun, and most recently, The Art Museum in Modern Times, which is available at Red Lion Books on the table outside the marquee. And the book explores the changing nature of museum architecture and design by looking at over 40 museums worldwide and sees Charles return to his original passion of architectural history. So Charles, we're just gonna jump straight into the, uh, like the white hot center of the book. Um, so just to explain how the book is or organized, although I, I described it very briefly, it's a, a survey with Charles's description and, and the takeaways in terms of both history and just observations about the architecture um, and what those, what the, the, the architectural attributes suggest or imply about the changing nature of museum going and the function of the museum. So on that note, um, Charles, explain how the function of museums has, has changed and evolved over the past 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to beat around the bush. I don't want to be, by, by the way, this is no excuse not to buy the book after the session. <laughs> well, I'll say a little bit about how I came to write the book and then I'll try and answer <laughs> the question. So, uh, as Joan said, I wrote a book about East London, which was actually not really a book. It was based on a blog, which my PA at the Royal Academy encouraged me to set up, which was meant to be saying what I was doing while I was working, but actually ended up being uh, uh, what I was doing when I wasn't working, when I live in Stepney, and it encouraged me to explore Stepney. And for complicated reasons, it ended up being published by Thames and Hudson. And after it was published in 2016, I thought I could do another book, maybe about central London or about Essex or about some other area based on the same model, which was writing short entries, which were easy to do and taking not very good photographs on my mobile phone. Uh, and then Thames and Hudson said, well, uh, no, actually, we don't want you to do that. We'd like you to write what they described as a real book. And I knew what they meant, <laughs> uh, a, a, a proper serious academic book, which basically I'd stopped doing because my experience when I was a museum director is you don't have time to do proper serious research. Uh, you can only do casual things on the side. But it was 2016. And I knew that the new building at the Royal Academy was going to open in 2018. And people were beginning to say, well, what are you going to do next? And I knew and understood perfectly well what that meant, which was, uh, you know, it's been nice having you, but we'll look forward to you disappearing shortly afterwards. <laughs> and so I thought, well, it would be good to do a proper book in which I look back, not quite at 100 years. My original idea was to look back to the Second World War. It was basically what's changed in museums during my adult lifetime. Because, because of this thing that when you're deeply involved and engaged and enmeshed in running institutions, you know that lots of things are happening beyond your own compass, but you don't know exactly what they are. So that originally I set out to write a book decade by decade. I started in 1945, slightly before I was born, but I did 1950s, so on. And then I finished it in the summer of 2019. I think because of COVID, it's very easy to get confused about which year is which. It all kind of merges together. And I showed the book to various friends, mainly in the States, and I could tell they all thought it was not very good. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, which was tricky because it was, you know, the story of my life, the story of museum, <laughs> how, how they had been built, how they had been run, Roy Strong, exhibitions, changes at the v &A. And part of the book was case studies of individual new museums. 
And in November uh, 2019, I, I thought, well, I'll junk about a half of the book and just focus on the individual new museums. I should say, being where we are and following the last talk, it includes the Sainsbury Centre, but it does not include First Sight. I, I chose ones I liked and admired and knew. I have visited all of them, even including, if we get to the illustrations, two, two that are illustrated, which I did just before lockdown in, in January 2020. Um, and it was a set of case studies. And then at the end, I tried to stand back and think about what had changed and why it had changed. So the um, fourth chapter is called Key Issues. And then particularly for this talk, because this talk is described as the future of the museum, not which is what the book is about, the past of the museum or the recent past of the museum. I had been asked to deliver the book on the 31st of March, uh, just over a year ago. And as you know, the 31st of March was a week after formal lockdown. It was about whatever it was, a month after uh, the government should have taken action. But um, I, I knew immediately that things were going to change. And I knew that things were going to change in ways which were going to be very tricky. I found the last talk, set of talks very, very illuminating because it shows how people have been creative in quite difficult circumstances with cuts in funding. So the final conclusion is a sense of trying to stand back and think about what was going to happen. You didn't answer my question. OK. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's completely correct. You see, <laughs> long experience as a museum director, like being a politician, is you learn to answer uh, the question you wish had been asked. I right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I, I jumped neatly over the final uh, section of the book, which is an attempt to say what's happened over the last hundred years. And basically, well, as an oversimplification of what is a complicated yeah. we'll start narrative. With that. We'll start with the oversimplification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started at the V&A in 1982, and at that stage, the V&A was about the collection preeminently and the interpretation and the understanding of the collection and its display as comprehensively as possible. And I know that at that stage, although I'm embarrassed to admit it, people didn't pay much attention to the public. They did not. Curators were esteemed for the quality of their knowledge, scholarship and interpretation of the collection. They were very, very impressive, but um, my first experience of one of the curators uh, was sitting in the National Art Library and uh, at the end of the day I was summoned and told that I couldn't expect to use the National Art Library as if I was a member of the public. I was now a museum curator. And I sort of realised that that meant you had entered a kind of different non-public uh, thing. And it's obvious that over time things have changed pretty radically. Uh, actually, I, I, one of the reasons I enjoyed the last talk, for those of you who heard it, is that I realised that the difference between the Sainsbury Centre and First Sight, particularly in the way it's currently being run by Sally, is a very good encapsulation of what's changed. So that the Sainsbury Centre was important as a private collection of the Sainsbury family. It was put as you will probably all know, at the end of the new East Anglia campus, uh, in such a way that the numbers of people who can get to it is not that great. It's not that publicly accessible, but it's a very, very internationally important, comprehensive and fine collection. What Sally has been doing, I mean, in a way, what first, what the first version of First Sight was in some ways the bad aspect, I th I'm afraid, I think, of what's happened, which is because of the Guggenheim in Bilbao, lots of cities all over the world, including presumably Colchester, thought that the solution to tourism and regeneration was to have a big, glossy, very expensive building designed by world-famous 
architect and to have a big competition. And lo and behold, up came First Sight. Um, and, uh, and it was hugely expensive, and it was very expensive, and it was by Raphael Vignoli, and it overshot its budget, as all projects unfortunately do. And then, as Sally described, it didn't get the audience it required. So that's, in a sense, some of the less good things of what's happened, of people treating museums just as civic monuments. The good aspect of what's happened is a shift towards a much closer engagement with the public, what the public wants of museums. And in the book, to an extent I hadn't realised, I did not write the book knowing what I was going to find. I wrote the book in order to work out in my own mind what had happened. And more clearly than I had anticipated, there is a very obvious shift if you go through the 43 museums I do from scholarship, interpretation, public education to, in a sense, uh, and, and I was, I think, careful to try and make sure that it was non-judgmental. Visitor experience, tourism, uh, and a sense of public involvement with institutions in a non-didactic and in some ways an anti-didactic way. So uh, the, the book is not a track. Uh, it, it's these case studies, and then I try and extract from the case studies what I think the general narrative is. But I did not go out with a sense that that was what I was going to discover. No, it's a fantastic book. It is very non-judgmental, even though I was able to infer your views in a few cases. <laughs> now, on the, um, to continue on the, the idea of the didactic, pedagogical, educational aspect of, the, of museums from uh, almost 100 years ago to now, where they're much more aesthetic or artist-centric, I wanted you to expand upon this quote from your book, which was about both Nicholas Sirota and Thomas Krenz. Um, who were, both had a seminal impact on museum design and museum going because, quote, their hearts belong to artists more than to art history. So, Charles, that's a good way to elaborate upon, to segue into. Yes, so Tom Krenz was the director of the Guggenheim, became director of the Guggenheim, I think, in 1988. And to be honest, uh, I hope he's not watching. <laughs> <laughs> When, when I was director of the National Gallery, there was a group of international museum directors uh, uh, called the BISO Group, and we used to meet. And um, the first meeting, when I started in 2002, was in Munich. And I went up to him and I said, which was true, I'd been to the exhibition he did about Brazil, and I went up to him and I said, gosh, I would really admired the exhibition he did about Brazil. And he looked at me because it became clear to me that nobody in that group uh, had said anything remotely complimentary to him because he was seen as, in a way, it was this moment of a move against the traditional scholarly and academic museum towards a much more aggressively business-oriented, franchised museum. And the traditional museum directors represented by the Bezo Group hated it and saw uh, 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 Tom Krenz as in a way, the enemy. Nick's road has started more or less at the same time, and it became clear to me that movements in museums, which sort of is obvious, it's inevitable because it's quite an international community, and also everybody is influenced by the same things. Tom Krenz, um, I now know more. At the time, I didn't really know, and he never answered any emails, but um, he, sp <laughs> he spent the 70s smoking dope. I mean, luckily, luckily he, uh, there's been an interview with him in which I was able to verify what I had intuited. He was trained as an artist, not as an art historian. That's very important. He was trained uh, at Williams College in Western Massachusetts. And art was changing. It was becoming, moving outside the museum. It was much more about installation. And he realised that the museums needed to change accordingly. And he started out in the mid-80s trying to set up this thing which did in the end open called Mass Mocha. It only opened, I think, in 2000. Um, and then he was hired by the Guggenheim and he went to the Guggenheim. He used to go during the week to do an MBA at Yale. And he went to the 
Guggenheim with a very, very clear view that he was going to change museums from being historical institutions to being representative of what artists wanted them to be. And what artists, he felt, wanted them to be was collecting a relatively small number of artists in great depth and allowing them to be involved in their display, not treating them, as Nick Sirota describes it in a lecture he did in 1996, as one, you know, a postage stamp in a historical trajectory. And Nick, likewise, in a way, he was trained as an art historian. He was at the court of, but then he went to the Museum of Modern Art as director very, very early, sort of pretty well when he graduated from the court of. And then he was at the White Chapel. The White Chapel is not a museum. It's an art gallery. It's very oriented towards the, traditionally very oriented towards the uh, local community and also very, very oriented towards contemporary art. And so when he went to the Tate, he took over from Alan Bowness. And I think... Uh, I, I've not talked to Nick about it. So, some, some museum directors I did check. To be perfectly honest, I was worried that he might not agree with what I said, so I, I didn't consult him about the text. But, but it seem, seems to me obvious that he came with many of the same ideas and the same beliefs as Tom of, exactly as Joan says, as my quote says, moving it from history to contemporary, moving it from art historians to the idea that artists are the generators of how art should be, look and be displayed. Now, actually, that observation about, um, well, that art-centric exhibitions meant that there was a deep collection of a single or deep exhibition of a single artist meant that museum directors during that epoch would have had a very outsized influence and actually been actually um, very, very influential. So you had like superstar museum directors like Tom Kranz or Nicholas Sirota. Um, and yet one of the quotes, another quote actually in your book is, because I want to make sure we're connecting the dots, the priesthood of the curator has gone to be replaced by what? So that's a complex in the context of what, I, of what you just described. It's not as simple as it sounds. Because in theory, a, a museum director gets to anoint, you know, it might be Yayoi Kusama, it, it might be uh, Gerhard Richter, and basically send them into the stratos their, their career into the stratosphere. And, that, and, and yet, is that true? That, so do you feel that it's, maybe it's not a priesthood, or maybe they're more like star architects or something else? Oh, okay, now, so the reference to the priesthood of the curators is a reference to the environment I found when I went to the V&A. So at the V&A, there, there, there were 120 curators. I mean, I don't know how many there are now, and, and Tristram Hunt is trying to reduce them, partly because, I, I mean, I feel that what Tristram Hunt has been trying to do, which I, I can perfectly understand, is to move away from this sense where you're employing large numbers of people who are concentrating to an extent on their own research towards making the institution much more in service of exhibitions. I mean, that has happened over time, uh, whether or not one likes it. But the reality is the priesthood of the, the curators, when I went to the Vinay, the curators were absolutely dominant on the culture of the institution. I, I, I was a member of what was called the education department and it was very, very hierarchical and being a member of the education department, you knew you were a second class citizen. Um, um, and that, that's shifted um, just because of this much greater orientation towards the public and tr traditional curators, as I've said, tended to be interested in the objects and the history of the objects and the identification of the objects and not so much in how things were displayed or community relationships. Right. So, so th there has been a huge change. So in this power shift or in this, you know, yeah. you have a constellation of deci decision makers in museum management. You are, so curators have less import or they have less decision making authority. Who has been, what, what has been in the ascendancy? I mean, or... Okay, so... so the, the structure when I went to the V&A was there were individual departments and the keepers of the department were very powerful uh, and they ran their departments semi-autonomously. Uh, and what happened was, for very understandable reasons, 
finance became much more important because the museum was expected to run its own finances, so the assistant director was a finance person, not a curator. Then HR became much more important. I mean, my experience of particularly the last 10, 15 years is that HR and running HR has become hugely much more important and hugely much more complicated, partly because of the legalities around issues to do with import, uh, employment. So that, you know, the, the director of the H, HR department tends now to be... The, the structure at the v &A, which is probably an encapsulation of these things, is that there's a kind of chief operating officer and then there will be probably the director of HR, probably the director of finance, and then one person, one person only, Antonio Bostrom, who represents the entire all the subject areas, furniture, sculpture, uh, textiles, and so on and so forth. And, and, and that's, that's the big change from a big kind of community run by individual heads of department to a much smaller management structure. Well, one of the big themes in your book is also that um, museums, the, the increasing and insidious influence on capitalism, and that museums are increasingly reliant on charitable, not char well, donations, or just corporate, corporate donations, et cetera, to survive. So I'm really talking about that <laughs> relation, that power relationship well, more well, than within, within the museum staff itself. Uh, okay, so right at the end, at the time when I was rewriting the text, I had what was called a consultant editor uh, who actually came from the Tate. And he said, there are two things you've got to deal with which are the controversies over the source of donations, and you've got to deal with restitution. And I said, I'm not going to deal with restitution. This was probably a misjudgment, because at the time, I felt that restitution was an issue for the big archaeological historical collections, and the book is about art museums. The one issue which I had been involved with and dealt with and the art community dealt with were things which had been um, acquired uh, with provenance during the 1930s and acquired as a result of Nazis. Uh, and that was a perfectly straightforward thing which started in America and then the international museum community decided that they must take action and I think pretty well have returned things which were acquired by families uh, from, from families during the 1930s. The, so the other thing which I did deal with, with is a section which I think I call the morality of wealth. Uh, and actually, contrary to what you say, I, I'm, I, I, museums since the Second World War have benefited from very wealthy individuals. And frankly, American museums benefited from um, big capitalists you know, Pierpont Morgan was a horrible person. Um, <laughs> but his museum is wonderful. Uh, and that's true. Uh, 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 Andrew Mellon, who set up the National Gallery of Art in Washington, you know, did it because he was about to be sent to prison for tax evasion. And, I, 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 I've, you know, I don't know so much about Henry P. Huntington, who set up the Huntington Gallery in California. But I'm sure he wasn't the nicest person to meet. And if one were going to look at the ethics of his business practices, one might look askance. But the truth is, they set up wonderful and very important institutions. So that I took the view in the book, which I knew at the time was very unfashionable and against the current orthodoxy. But I felt when I was at the academy that the institution which people were giving money to was a good institution. The purposes for which their money was going to be put was good. And that it wasn't for me to take a view on who they were and how the money had been made. And actually, my view... I noticed Tristram Hunt was in the Daily Telegraph, but I don't have a subscription to the Telegraph, uh, this week, saying that people have stopped giving money. And in the book, in that section, I say it's obvious people are not going to give money if people are going to be snooty about how they made the money and are going to be critical of it. I mean, who would want to be subject to being pilloried publicly <laughs> if, if the consequence of giving the money... We, we did what all institutions have done. I realise, as I say this, 
I'm treading on very thin ice because the last time I said this on a Zoom call, uh, I got immediately attacked for it. And, uh, but the fact is that museums have been, in my view, like the Catholic Church, where they take money from sinners and the sinners put their money to good use. And unlike a priest, I'm not going to make a moral judgment about who the people are. I, 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 I found many of them very agreeable and interesting people. <laughs> and, and what I knew, which I, I think is the big problem, which people haven't really woken up to, is that if every museum director is going to look down their nose at potential donors on the grounds that they're amoral characters who have made their money in bad ways, those donors are going to pick that up very fast and they're not going to give money to art institutions. And I think that is going to be... In, in, in my four things at the, in the final section, the first thing was this issue that I think it's going to be tricky for institutions which now are very dependent on private giving if the culture... And it's not, I mean, it's not just within the arts. It's a much broader shift in the moral environment where, you know, it started with tobacco... And then, uh, not surprisingly, it was armaments, <laughs> and then booze, and now it's the entire capitalist system. Well, unfortunately, at the moment, the government is not going to pay for museums. It has to be a partnership between uh, the government and the private sector, and therefore, I think people have to work with the private sector and not be too judgmental of it. Actually, I'm going to say something just as controversial based on everything <laughs> you just said. In fact, should we actually be returning to more noblesse oblige as a way to fund museums? Because one of the fronts on which museums are being attacked, stated in your book, at, the, at its conclusion, is the assault on the canon of the original mission as well as the actual content of the canon. If the museum is no longer fulfilling its original historical purpose of being an educational institution and is more um, accurately described as an entertainment business, isn't it reasonable to expect less public funding if there can be no agreement on what should constitute the content of that experience? I think the truth is the change which Sally described uh, in first sight from being a big, glossy, international kind of grand building which didn't have very much connection to its local community. That's the shift. I mean, uh, over the last year, for obvious reasons, because I wrote the book and then I knew that I would be asked <laughs> these sorts of questions. Uh, um, in... There's a museum consultant called Andres Santo, who I, I didn't really know, but I've been in touch with. And he did rather a brilliant thing, which is he realised lots of people would be interested in this issue of the future of the museum. And he emailed 28 of his friends, who he had worked with, most of them, I suspect, and asked them what do they think, or interviewed them on Zoom, presumably. And the book came out in November. Without exception... I mean, there may have been a slight cast in the way, in the selection. Not one of them, not one single one of the 28 makes any reference whatsoever to the responsibilities towards the collection in their care. Not one. All of it is about the role of the museum in terms of its relationship towards its community and its kind of civic responsibilities. So that that, that, I mean, I found interesting, if not a bit unsettling. But what it demonstrated is the museum has been reinvented periodically. And the book is a demonstration of how Alfred Barr, who was the director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, very much reinvented the museum in the late uh, 1920s. He came in, he was only in his 20s himself, and he, uh, he and his <coughs> friends, they were hostile to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and the Metropolitan Museum. They wanted something different, and they did it differently. And it may be that the effect of COVID, which will produce a much less funding, people aren't going to be able to afford to do big buildings in the way they have over the last 50 years, probably. And therefore, they will... 
kind of re-describe their purposes in terms of local civic and community engagement. So that that would be a perfectly legitimate way of seeking public funding. You partly answered my final question before I open it to the floor. What is the future of the art museum? <laughs> but if, you, if you want to, I know you can't answer that question. Yeah, no, no, I, I can't because can, can, that's what I was expecting to be asked. <laughs> that, that I can answer relatively. So uh, uh, on the 3rd of March last year, I wrote the conclusion in which there has a somewhat anxious sense to it. The majority of it is about problems I felt museums would face uh, uh, to do with uh, sources of funding and to do with changes in attitudes to the canon. And I just added the last sentence I wrote was a, a, a sentence in response to Black Lives Matter. And, and that, I think, in combination, these things are, are tricky. I ended deliberately with on an upbeat note, because exactly as I've said, I think museums have continuously reinvented themselves. And now, a year and a, four months on, I feel a bit more optimistic, partly because there are lots of new institutions opening. I mean, we haven't looked at the pictures. Uh, but, oh, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> we completely don't, don't forgot. Uh, uh, you know, the, the new Museum of the Home has opened. The Courtauld opens in November. The v &A, is opening two institutions in Olympic Park. Uh, yeah. There. So this, uh, which is by Twomey O'Donnell, or Donald Twomey, who are Irish architects, uh, which is under Next construction at the moment. But the one before, or the one afterwards, yeah, this I think is really interesting. This, this is um, all the collections of the Vinay made publicly available. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a version of the Victorian Museum. It's probably organised by material because it's much easier to store things by material. And the public will be able to go and see things. So that, in a way, it's a translation of what the traditional idea of the museum was, of publicly accessible, open storage, and you make your own mind up as to how you interpret it and use it. So, so that's coming up. Uh, the National Gallery is redoing the Sainsbury Wing. The, the British Museum has a huge, great, very complex way of reinventing itself, which has not yet been publicly available. And, and that's the ones I know in London. There are lots of international projects. The Art Gallery of New South Wales is doing a new thing. There's the M Plus in Hong Kong. So that they're still big projects, but also, you know, to, to end the, in, in, in a formal way, I, I think this rethinking, having to rethink, because there's less big funding and museums are having to reflect and have had the opportunity to re reflect isn't necessarily a bad thing. I think that people will pay much more attention to their permanent collections, which have been somewhat neglected. They'll be much less dependent on big exhibitions because they won't be able to afford big exhibitions in the same way. And they will, in a way, probably, to an extent, go back to their core mission. Oh, I hope so, too. I, I mean... I agreed with most of your conclusions. Not that that's important. <laughs> um, now, we're ready to take some questions from the floor for Charles. Please. Hi, thank you so much. That was a really wonderful talk. Um, I just have something to say in relation to uh, what you were talking about in terms of ethics and funding, because it's something that, as an artist, that I think about a lot. Um, so when you were saying how museums in a way, don't have the, a leg to stand on to say no to certain money. I, I really have to question that because there must be an ethical line somewhere. I know that it's something that I think about in relation to the Zabludovich collection and stuff that I've personally turned down in that relation, but I, I feel like as you're talking about the museum becoming almost like a civic center and having a responsibility to its audience, doesn't that also come in line with the ethics of the funding? Yeah, no, as I hope I made clear, I know that my views are now somewhat out of date. When I started at the Academy, this shows, I think, the change in the climate of public opinion, that uh, we were offered funding uh, 
by a company called JTI, which stands for Japan Tobacco International. And we took a lot of time and energy and we sought legal advice and we had a lawyer on the board, which was the council, and his view then, supported by charity law, was that it's not charities are under an obligation to accept funding providing it's legal funding, pro pro providing it's legal. It's not for charities to make moral judgments. That, that now, I think, probably is an indefensible moral and ethical position. I don't think you would find... Although, interestingly, uh, in that other uh, well-known magazine, uh, I noticed Tristram Hunt, who's got, also got a book to publish, uh, was interviewed by Tatler, who asked him uh, what they're going to do about the Sackler Courtyard. And he said, we will keep it. Um, uh, not least because Teresa Sackler is one of our trustees, which I knew... <laughs> Uh, um, uh, but I found it interesting because, in a way, the controversy around the Sacklers has been the touch point of argument, dispute, and criticism all over the world because almost everybody, including the Royal Academy, had been given money by the Sackler family. And I suppose that artists like Hito Style was like using their leverage and their their position correctly, as a way correctly. to. It's the it's the artists. I mean, actually, in the book. There's a history to it because um, in the late 60s, I think it was, artists objected to the fact that Nelson Rockefeller was the chairman of the Museum of Modern Art. And, and so they started uh, campaigning against him being chairman. And if you look at what's been happening in New York, it's the artists who have led the campaigns against the trustee boards of the Whitney Museum and the... At Museum of Modern Art. So, so as I say, that, that, that is a big shift. And, you know, I'm sure you're representative. I, I, I did an event uh, at, at this uh, media organisation called Tortoise, and I was trying to defend the position I've described, and I, I could feel that in the audience there was absolute implacable hostility. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question. Charles, an easy one after the difficult one. Um, looking a little bit further ahead, will museums in the future actually need buildings? Well, I, I, I mean, I really enjoyed the last session. Just because this thing of moving into uh, um, department stores, you know, Oxford Street's obviously in trouble, and the, uh, putting a mound next door to Marble Arch is not going to solve the problems of Oxford Street. And... Um, I, one of the big controversies I faced when I was at the BNA was the fact that in, in Japan, which is true, they, the department stores do very good international exhibitions on the top floor. And they do it to encourage people, you know, to come to the department store. But they're, they're isolated and they're beautifully displayed and they're incredibly professionally run. And you, you, you could say that that's why I enjoyed Sally's presentation because it was this move away from the building. My, my book, I, I, I know, I, I'm described by Nick Penny as a so-called building director. I like doing buildings and I found them interesting as ways of reinventing and reshaping the experience of the institution, which is what I did at the Portrait Gallery to a less extent at the National Gallery uh, and at the Royal Academy. But... Um, you know, the next generation will be different and will have to be different because they won't be able to afford to do these big projects. Okay, well, I'm going to ask you the final question. What's your favourite museum? <laughs> um, I don't know if we have the picture. I know the answer, Charles. <laughs> no, no, I changed change the answer. Uh, oh, you but, did? Uh, well... Uh, I, I tr I've always tried to avoid those questions or answering them definitively. You know, I, I always felt it was a bad idea when I was in National Gallery to say what my favourite picture was. And so the two <laughs> ones which I tend to name, and, and which is probably what you already know, I'm very keen on this place in Aoshima off the coast of Japan. They're, they're the two museums which are most difficult to get to. <laughs> because if you go to Naoshima, 
It, uh, you know, you have to get a train from I've Tokyo, and it's it's, insane. But it's a fantastic place. It's completely wonderful, and it's very immersive. And you have to spend the night. And after they built the museum, they built this beautiful hotel where they give you special pajamas. And it's a sort of <laughs> <laughs> actually, I'll tell this story because I didn't put it. In There's the book. no internet. I, I put it in. The, I didn't put it in the book. It was sort of rather amazing. The pajamas were so wonderful. I bought three pairs. But, <laughs> But when I got back to London, they're absolutely horrible. I've never worn them at all. <laughs> it was to do with this immersive environment, of a meditative environment. And, and that, for me, was very important because so much of the pressure in the West has been to make it more commercial and have a bigger restaurant and a bigger shop. And in Japan, it's exactly the opposite, to go and reflect and meditate and get away from everyday life and be calm and enjoy the work of art over a longer period of time. And as you can tell, although the book tries to disguise my real feelings, <laughs> my real feelings so that that's very important. And then the, the, uh, the just, just show, show up this uh, uh, Mona, Mona. In, uh, uh, which there made a go. huge impact on me, uh, which is even harder to get to than Naoshima. Because somebody said to me, you can't do this book without going to Hobart in Tasmania. And going on a day trip to Tasmania is far from straightforward, I can assure you, and I don't recommend it because actually it too has a hotel, interestingly, and you need to spend really a long time because it, the museum is underground and you have to explore it. And then absolutely no labels. It's the epitome of this move from instruction to experience. Everything is on uh, sound guides, which are compulsory, and it's brilliantly done and it's, I think, a very effective museum even though the owner who constructed it, David Walsh, who's a gambler, talking of people who one might not necessarily approve of, uh, uh, um, did it in order to annoy people like me. But actually, I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> With, uh, please, everyone give Charles a round of applause, because that was a fantastic talk. Um,